And um, so we'll end now just with a few words about uh, the school of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. Um, and uh, I think what I'll do here is simply mention uh, some of the readings that are available. Uh, first of all, as I noted in other classes, uh, the Encyclopedia of Islam is a really valuable resource. And uh, you can get it now on CD. I've, I've had the CD of the Encyclopedia of Islam for the last six years, uh, even before it was completed. Then they would renew it until, until the, the time that they actually completed it, which was about two years ago. And the Encyclopedia of Islam is extremely useful for a thousand things. Uh, let's say, for example, that you wanted to know about the Hausa language, and you wanted to know about things like how the Hausa used uh, their language to uh, incorporate the culture of West Africa into poems and songs and things like that, you can begin in the Encyclopedia of Islam. Um, you want to know about the Muslims of China, or you want to know about um, the Maturidis, or you'd like to begin readings because they have bibliography. It's extremely useful. It's an extremely excellent resource. Uh, it's a good place to begin. And Ibn Abdul Wahhab, Muhammad Ibn Abdul Wahhab, is an entry in the encyclopedia, which is a very good place to begin if you're interested in studying his movement. His movement is an 18th century movement, and um, it's part of the general reform movements of the 18th century that are really important in Islamic history because they affect the great 19th century reform movements that then feed into the 20th century movements, all of them being different, but all of them very important. And the 18th century is really that critical, pivotal century when Muslims have now become something else, when Muslims now are aware of the fact that they are no longer a world civilization, that they are no longer a dominant people, that they are a people that is rapidly losing ground, and that there is another force in the world, the West, especially the Europeans, the colonial Europeans, who are gradually taking everything and only leaving what they don't want. Uh, so the 18th century is a time of great crisis, and um, the Wahhabi movement is one of the responses to that crisis. Um, one of the uh, other Sunni responses to that crisis is Shah Waliullah of Delhi, uh, Shah Waliullah of Delhi is uh, one of the really brilliant respondents to the 18th century crisis. And there are some similarities, but there are also great differences. Um, Sheikh Othman Danfodio of West Africa and his movement is another example of a late 18th century and early 19th century response. So Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab should be studied in the context um, of those 18th century reform movements. And in that regard, uh, I recommend the book by Levtsian and Vol, 18th Century Renewal and Reform in Islam. That this is a very good book, very beneficial, and this will give you a context in which to put Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. One of the things that's interesting about him is the fact that his is a reform movement which, like Shah Waliullah and like the Shia also of the same time, is fundamentally concerned with the differences of opinion and sects that, have, that seem to have torn the Muslims apart. Uh, many of the reformers, when they would s consider the weakness of Muslims, they would say that, you know, we are so different, we are so dispersed, we are so uh, diverse, we are so dispersed, and we need to come back together. We need to be unified. This is a fundamental concern of Shah Waliullah. And it's also a fundamental concern of Ibn Abdul Wahhab. And therefore, his ijtihad is similar in many ways to the kind of ijtihad we talked about earlier tonight when we spoke about a type of ijtihad that is not really so much concerned with problems and solutions as it's concerned with trying to unify opinions. Like, let's all pray the same way, okay? Let's all make wudu the same way, which is really impossible. That's never going to happen because the methodological differences that are there in the schools are always going to be there. It's always going to be like, well, how do you evaluate the unique hadith? And like, I can't accept that because to me, there are other sources that are more authoritative. So that's not going to, but, but in the Wahhabi movement, 
you have a very literalist approach to that, that let's just follow the hadith, as if the hadith didn't have complexities. And um, in the Shia at the same time, you have the revival of the Akhbari movement, which is a movement that follows Akhbar, it follows reports, except that in the case of the Twelver Shia, the reports that they're talking about are not exactly the same reports we're talking about. They're talking about hadith that they transmit from the Prophet through their transmitters, which are often the same as our hadith, sometimes different, but generally speaking there's a lot of overlap. And then they're talking about the reports of the imams. So we have the statements of Fatima, who's not an imam, but she's an authoritative source. And then you have Imam Ali, Imam Hassan, Imam al Hussein, and you know the different imams of the line. And those are called akhbar. They're not hadith, but they are akhbar and they're authoritative. So in the case of the <coughs> uh, Imam Shia, you also have this akhbari school, which is really strong in the 18th century. And again, that is fundamentally concerned with the same kind of thing the Wahhabis were concerned with, which was trying to remove all these different opinions that people have and trying to unify the Shia around a particular core of doctrine and of legal practice. And in that case, the Akhbari were opposed to the Mujtahidun, or the Usulis, as they're called. The Usulis were the Shia who believe in Usul al-Fiqh and who believe in um, uh, Ijtihad that goes back to living Mujtahids. Uh, that has a very interesting tradition among the Shia. So you have this strong conflict in the 18th century, and you have a similar conflict among the Wahhabis, because the original Wahhabis are not even Hanbalis. Even though they come out of the Hanbali school, they, in fact, reject all schools. And they want people to do ijtihad on the basis of an essentially very literalist understanding of the Qur'an and the Hadith. Now, um, the Wahhabi movement was extremely controversial, and it remains that way till this day. Um, and among Sunnis, it was regarded generally as heretical, and among Shia, it was definitely regarded as heretical um, because of the fact that the Wahhabis pitted themselves against the majority Sunni community and also the Shia community. And um, although they never did jihad against a non-Muslim power, in fact, they allied uh, from a very early period with the British and then with the Americans, they did fight against Sunni Muslims and Shia Muslims, and they often carried out massacres, and uh, they often uh, did atrocious things, absolutely atrocious things. So this pitted the majority of the Sunni community against them because of these atrocities and also because of the innovations in Wahhabi teaching, which from a traditional Sunni point of view, um, you know, were innovative, especially in the area of doctrine. So um, I think that what's very good here is to begin by looking at two very different points of view. One of those would be Hamid Alger and his book Wahhabism. This is a, a good little book. Uh, not, uh, you can read it in an in the evening. And uh, Hamid Alger is very clear that he is an enemy of Wahhabism. Um, he takes the traditional Sunni and Shia approach to the Wahhabis. Uh, he is nevertheless a historian, and one of the things that's good about uh, Alger is the fact that he draws on all the historical sources. So he looks at Sunni sources, and he looks at Wahhabi sources, and he looks at Western travel accounts and so forth. Um, the picture is not a very bright picture in this book. Then you have another book by Natana DeLong Bas, Wahhabi Islam, which came out not too long ago. Uh, she was a student at Georgetown. And this tends to paint a very positive picture of the Wahhabis. Um, I don't think it should have been accepted as um, a doctoral thesis. Uh, first of all, her knowledge of Arabic is very limited. She makes huge mistakes. And methodologically, she admits to the fact that the Wahhabi movement was very controversial, but she relies almost exclusively on Wahhabi historical sources. So she doesn't take from the other Sunni sources, Ottoman or non-Ottoman, and she doesn't take from travel accounts, 
Um, she simply regards that material as too problematic to deal with, and a historian can't do that. All the material is problematic. And it all has to be weighed and sifted until we can try to find uh, the real account. But nevertheless, uh, she attempts to be fair. And there are a lot of statements that are fair and are just that are probably quite valid. One of the things that's good about her book is the fact that she shows that there was a very big difference between Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab and his immediate family and what they taught and preached and between the followers uh, who uh, often were very ignorant Bedouins and who often took his teaching to extremes and who are often uh, directly guilty for the great atrocities of the Wahhabi movement. 